North Carolina's best kept secret. The Pigeon River runs through Sunburst Trout Farm. It's dammed at Lake Logan. One farm sits at the base of the dam, which provides a rush of water into these raceways where rainbow trout are raised. All it is is just a run of water going through 6,000 gallons a minute. You can fit about eight to 10,000 pounds of full-grown fish in these raceways. Wes Eason's grandfather, Dick Jennings, founded the original trout farm in 1948. He was the first commercial trout farmer east of the Mississippi River. And a pioneer in North Carolina aquaculture. Jennings had been raising mink. He knew that food was more stable than fashion. Jennings also knew the water here is perfect for raising trout. If you don't have pure, clean water, number one, the trout just won't make it because they require such insanely pure water. The trout are put in the raceways as tiny hatchlings. This is our pelletized feed, which provide the fish with a heavy protein, heavy fat diet, which is good for both growth and flavor. Once they reach a certain size, we will grade the fish, which just simply means to separate them by size. They're moved from raceway to raceway as they grow until they reach about one and a half to two pounds. It takes about a year and a half to go from hatchling to harvest. Here's how it works. Two workers slide a screen down the raceway. So when you walk that screen down, the fish are hemmed up perfectly. A boom lowers a net into the water and scoops out the trout. Each net full is about six to 700 pounds. The fish are dumped into water tanks on the back of a truck. The truck takes the fish to a nearby facility where workers process them into fillets. Sunburst processes nearly 700,000 pounds of trout a year and sells it to more than 400 restaurants nationwide, small to medium grocery chains, and seafood wholesalers. It's going to have a nice robust flavor to it, but not so strong that you would describe as fishy. Sunburst also sells trout in its retail shop in Waynesville and on its website. There, you can also buy its other trout products, including smoked fillets, smoked trout dip, and even trout burgers. Eason says demand for trout keeps growing. Over the years, we've realized that you have to have aquaculture to keep the demands off of wild stocks. Wild is fantastic, but if, if there were no farms, no aquaculture, wild would, would be done. You couldn't keep up. produce farm-raised catfish. Carolina Classics Catfish Farm, just outside of Aden, grows catfish on 27 ponds, spanning 270 acres. We're taking a fish that's already five to six inches long and placing it in the grow-out ponds, and we're growing that fish in one season to about two pounds average. Rob Mayo founded this business in 1986. I got into aquaculture because I had a personal experience watching a commercial fisherman neighbor uh, have problems continuing to work in that industry just because of the pressure on global wild fisheries. Back it up. The farm harvests its catfish based on customer demand. And we'll take a tractor on either side of the pond and we'll pull large net through that pond. Smaller fish escape the net. And so we're only keeping the market size fish in that net basket. Once they corral the catfish, things really get going. And drops them into water tanks on the back of a truck. Today's harvest is about 10,000 pounds. The fish are hauled to the processing plant and dumped into holding tanks. We're basically taking those live fish and turning them into mainly fish fillets, also a portion that we call a nugget. We're selling fish primarily in the mid-Atlantic and northeast market over to the Chicago land area and in eastern Canada. 
The company sells millions of pounds of catfish a year to grocery stores and restaurants. Catfish is a mild, high-protein, relatively low-fat fish. It has broad appeal because of that. People who don't even like fish oftentimes like catfish. These hybrid striped bass have just been harvested from a pond in Beaufort County. Workers are using a net to corral them in a holding tank. They scoop them out in baskets, weigh them, and load them onto a truck. The fish will make a nearly 800-mile trip to Toronto, Canada, where they'll be sold live. And the reward for the owner of Carolina Fisheries? Money. <laughs> Lee Brothers used to grow row crops. Farming soybeans, corn, and tobacco. And then? In 1985, I lost $85,000 farming due to a drought. So I said, you know, it might be time to look at something different. He started working with NC State researchers who were creating a hybrid bass. It's a cross between a striped bass and a white bass. Hybrids grow faster than the original species. Next thing you know, Brothers was raising hybrid striped bass. He established Carolina Fisheries in 1987. They're hatching now. It all starts in the hatchery where tiny fish called fry emerge from the eggs. They go from there to a pond to develop. And in about 30 days, they'll be about an inch, inch and a half long. Then they're taken to these raceways. We bring them up and put them in here, train them to feed and grade them. They'll be moved to three more ponds as they continue to grow. 14 to 18 months later, we have a finished product of around two pounds. That's when the fish are harvested in much the same way they were at Carolina Classics Catfish Farm. We'll move about anywhere from 15 to 25,000 pounds a week. The fish are shipped live to markets in Toronto and New York City. Brothers started with three three-acre ponds. Now he has 60 of them, and the rewards are more than just money. Oh, I love being out, and I love working with fish. It is rewarding. Brothers says it's also more predictable than the farming he used to do. I still miss it, but I like this better. Next, fish farms include crawfish, too. A whole lot easier than raising children. <laughs> This is Marshallburg Farm. We raise Russian sturgeon for caviar. Those Russian sturgeon are being raised in tanks inside two barns on this 300-acre tract of land in Carteret County near Harker's Island. There's the one I want right here. This is a male Russian sturgeon. Weighs about 15 pounds. This fish um, is destined for our meat market, uh, smoked fish. Um, and he's kept in here until we're ready to harvest. It's not the males that keep this business afloat. It's the females whose eggs, called roe, are harvested and processed to make caviar. We produce Ocetra caviar, which is noted for its buttery, nutty taste, as well as its coloration, which is kind of a light amber brown. We're the only producer of Russian sturgeon of Cetra caviar in the United States at this scale. We do a recirculating aquaculture system, which means that all the water volume that you see in the tanks uh, in this building is recirculated 24-7, uh, uh, filtered 24-7, and maintained and managed uh, for the duration of the fish's life which can be upwards of 10 years uh, before a successful caviar harvest. We've hatched these fish here from eggs and we've kept them in tanks, sorted, graded them. In this building, we have about 7,000 fish in our tanks. The number of fish in each tank varies depending on size and age and also the gender identity of the fish. An ultrasound test determines the gender of the fish. Yeah. Yeah. The roe is harvested from the females. Once it's salted and packed, then it becomes caviar. Before then, it's, it's simply fish roe. It retails for roughly $2 a gram, depending on the grade of the caviar. And who buys it? 
customers all over the United States. We're also licensed to sell uh, internationally. It's not a business to get in to make money quick. You have to wait a long time to get product to get that far, and you have to invest a lot. Overfishing, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, has driven the demand for Russian sturgeon and its valuable caviar. So did overfishing here. In North Carolina in 1910, sturgeon was in the top five most important commercial fisheries. Today, few people have even heard of it. There hasn't been lots of wild stock available, and so fish farms have had to come in and, and, and take that vacuum and be able to produce. It was a beautiful piece of property. I mean, it was just so pretty. I couldn't believe it was sitting there empty. And it had so much resources to it. I was like, you yeah, can't let this sit here and do nothing. Sandra and William Parnell bought this old 36-acre prawn farm in 2015. It hadn't been used in years. The person they hired to stock the ponds with fish suggested putting crawfish in one. Sandra liked the idea. I didn't want to have to go to Louisiana and get them anymore. <laughs> So I figured, you know, hey, we got this here, let's raise our own. We grow the Louisiana Red Swamp Crawfish. It's a particular breed. They are not natural to our environment, so you are required to have a license to grow those. Parnell's farm has deeper ponds than most Louisiana farms, allowing her to extend her season. She says crawfish are pretty easy to grow. A whole lot easier than raising children. <laughs> a whole lot easier. <laughs> Parnell says she adds some grains and grasses to the ponds for feed, but other than that, the crawfish take care of themselves. Crawfish, from the time it's born to full grown adult size would be about six months. They grow relatively fast. The crawfish are caught in traps, which are harvested from spring through fall. That's a nice trap. Parnell sells all she harvests from her three ponds, nearly 6,000 pounds a year. I wished I had more ponds. I really do, because the demand is so high here. Crawfish people are serious about their food. <laughs> they are very serious about it. They get real upset if they can't buy. $5.99 About 90% of Parnell's sales are through phone orders. She also sells crawfish and other products at this store in downtown Kenley. Thank you. Crawfish can be done etouffee, in jambalaya, or fried, but most people simply like them boiled. Parnell sees a bright future for crawfish farming in North Carolina. You don't have to have a whole lot of land. Your most expensive thing is buying your stock the first time. Then let the crawfish do their thing. They pretty much are self-sustaining. I mean, they are crafty little things. <laughs> This is to me is the historic district of NC Oysters. This is Stump Sound. You know, anywhere in North Carolina you go, everybody wants a Stump Sound oyster. It's a special place. You get a special taste that, that it creates. Ryan Godot has three children, so he called his oyster company Three Little Spats. Spats a baby oyster. Godot leases about 50 acres of water in Stump Sound near Topsail Island to grow oysters from babies to full size. We lease it from the state, and what we've got here is, uh, is a bunch of bottom cages. Every single one of these floats is a bottom cage that holds several thousand uh, oysters that are in grow out right now. We're just putting them out in their natural environment. They're eating algae and nutrients, getting all that from the water, and just getting bigger and bigger so they can just filter more. Oysters have one goal, and that's to get bigger. <laughs> Luckily for us. <laughs> the oysters grow at different rates, taking anywhere from four to 18 months to reach market size. When they reach two inches, Godot and his son take them out of the bottom cages and move them to another leased area with floating cages. That is exactly what we're looking for there. There is a lot of good sized oysters up there. Raising oysters is a lot of work. You figure we have over a million oysters out here, and we have to check every single one at least every two weeks, two or three weeks, and just see what they're doing. 
whenever you're at an oyster bar paying a premium for a farmed oyster as opposed to a wild oyster, what you're paying for is that labor that makes it that perfect shape, singles, not very dirty. You're just paying for all that. Very happy with this. At the floating cages, the oysters are put into a tumbler that sorts them by size. What we're looking for is to get all this white lip knocked off right here. So once we get that knocked off, the oyster uh, grows a little bit more hardy and, uh, and widens out a bit. In the floating cages, the wave action helps the oysters grow and take on a more rounded shape before they are sold. So this section is extremely fluid. Uh, oysters are constantly moving in and out, being sold. Our oyster is created for the half shell market. Currently we're shipping them anywhere from New York City uh, down to Savannah, Georgia. The big difference between us and the wild is that, you know, we're year round, where the wild guys are from, you know, uh, you know, what, the end of September till March. I call it the, the Carolina Gold Rush right now. There's a lot of people getting into it. Godot doesn't see himself in competition with watermen who harvest wild oysters. It's a different product. Everybody owns this water, and you know we 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 love the, the wild guys and hope they love us too. Next, what's the future of fish farming in our state and nation? Humans need more fish to eat. The only place that can come from is fish farming. So we're sorting these oysters by size so we can separate out the ones that are ready for market, ready to be eaten. David Serino chairs the Aquaculture Technology Program at Carteret Community College in Moorhead City. So that tub over there is went through one and three quarters and retained on one and a quarter. The college created it in 2005 in partnership with Brunswick Community College. My students come from a variety of different fields and backgrounds. Yeah, so we're doing millimeters. Generally, they have a love for the marine environment or a love for a specific species that they want to get into. The college offers a certificate and a two-year associate's degree in aquaculture for students looking to work at an aquaculture operation, start their own, or supplement an existing career. 15-year-old Isaac Beasley is in the early college program pursuing an associate's degree. I live by the water. I want to stay by the water. This is one of the ways I can do it and there's a necessity for it. Aquaculture is one of the biggest growing businesses in the world as it stands, and it's much more sustainable than wild caught fish. North Carolina has about 300 fish farms generating around $60 million a year in sales. I mean, you look at the, the truck drivers that are involved with it, hauling that product, the processing plants, the feed plants, all those different things that, that tie into it would multiply that number. Of the fish sold, about 35% is trout, 25% is hybrid striped bass, 20% catfish, with the remaining 20% being other finfish and shellfish. It's a multi, multi-million dollar industry that's a stealth industry that most people don't even know is there. And it's going to become, no doubt in my mind, much, much bigger. One reason is because traditional commercial fishing can't keep up with demand for fish. Right now, over 90% of the seafood that the U.S. consumes is imported. So as you look at the growing trend for seafood and, and the demand for seafood, how will that be met? The belief is through aquaculture. Anderson says aquaculture is supplementing, not competing with traditional commercial fishing. We're all in this game together, and our goal is to produce a safe, reliable source of food for this growing population, and aquaculture can do that. But our state's aquaculture industry needs to overcome some challenges to grow. There are a lot of misconceptions out there about aquaculture. Many tied to questionable conditions at foreign fish farms. North Carolina fish farmers say quality control standards here are much higher. The trends now are to sustainable, to make sure that product is something that's environmentally focused and going through and being raised correctly. And it's just really about people understanding it better and realizing that it is not a lower quality product than the wild caught. Unlike wild caught fish, supply is not as subject to seasons or weather, and fish can get to your plate quicker. With aquaculture, you harvest it when you need it, and so you can have a much fresher, higher quality product, 
and that is something that chefs are starting to realize and that is trickling down to the rest of the consumers. The growth of aquaculture in our state and nation depends on those consumers choosing domestic fish over imported. That means looking at labels, not just prices. You just have to stop, do a little research, and look for those options. As for the future of the industry in our state? I think it's unlimited. Watch this and many more award-winning documentaries anytime. Go to WRALDocumentary.com or stream it from any of these platforms.